What's in a turkey vulture pellet? The answer and more from a study of almost 4,000 Southern California vulture pellets. This is another JDW Talks. My targeted audience are raptor biologists, field biologists and ecologists, ornithologists, California naturalists. This was recorded in October of 2020. I have an unpublished paper on this. There's a link there which describes in greater detail uh, the findings of this study. So here we are, and this uh, photograph and most of the photos you will see were taken decades ago. We're at the mission at San Juan Capistrano. It's in uh, the southern part of Orange County, California. And it was known for swallows returning and nesting there. In fact, a number of the stores around the mission specialize in selling swallow porcelain uh, souvenirs, that sort of thing. Uh, especially catering to Easterners. And Eastern, Easterners uh, expected the swallows to be their barn swallow with a forked tail, as this sign shows. But that's not the swallow that came back. It were the cliff swallows. They don't have forked tails. Unfortunately, urbanization of the area have reduced the uh, insects in the area. And it's very unusual for swallows to nest at the mission today, today meaning 2020. There was another bird species, however, uh, associated with San Juan Capistrano. And they were turkey vultures. So as a kind of a stunt, uh, I, I made that banner on my field uh, uh, truck. And the, there was a roost of turkey vultures in the northern part of San Juan Capistrano. And that's what I want to talk to you about. In fact, I gave a talk in 19, what does it say, 1992. And I almost labeled this, this uh, video the buzzards of San Juan Capistrano. So turkey vultures are uh, a pretty impressive uh, bird species, if you see it. They primarily eat carrion, dead animals. And they soar over roads, fields, open forests, looking for their prey. They have a great sense of smell and sight, probably the best sense of smell among all bird species. And for such a large bird, they're pretty light. They rock uh, in the air like a, like a tightrope walker, unlike a golden eagle that's rock salad. Uh, they scavenge, they're an important part of the decomposer ecosystem, and they eject, they regurgitate pellets of undigested material. Now, I happened to um, come across this roost uh, in 1991 when I was doing some garage sailing. And on November 16th, there was a community sale in this particular tract. And wow, what, what could have caused that? So I asked around and I found out that a year before turkey vultures had moved into the uh, development. And you can see uh, the, the trees, the large trees here, eucalyptus trees, with turkey vultures uh, in the tree. And most of the uh, roostings occurred during, um, uh, along this particular uh, part of the uh, of the development and I went out and on almost a hundred different days collected over the course of a year pellets that had fallen on this lawn and I got to know the daily routine 
of the turkey vultures. They often, in the early morning, went over to this large electrical tower, and then they warmed themselves up. This is called a spread wing pattern. And I went online and there's information about this. It's, it's, it's indicated that the spread wing posture appear to serve for both, for both thermal regulation and drying in turkey vultures. These birds maintain their body temperature at a lower level, they conserve energy, at night than in the daytime. And morning wing spreading should provide a means of absorbing solar energy and passively raising the temperature to the daytime level. I also recorded on a number of occasions them coming back to the roost. And they start to arrive back at the roost about two hours before sunset. You can see some of the data that we generated. They don't have during the, the winter time much time to actually forage. And so I did a little activity budget and only about a quarter of the day they're actually going out looking for prey. Now, another factor you should know is that there was a sanitary landfill, and there still is, 6.4 kilometers southeast of this roost. And I went over there with the permission of the staff, and there were about 20 or 30 turkey vultures that were scavenging on that landfill along with lots and lots of gulls. You can just barely see that one turkey vulture in the top slide uh, in the shadow and there are two of them uh, on the bottom. So one would expect there might be some refuse in some of the turkey vulture pellets that I was collecting. Some information about the study um, we generated uh, a number of graphs. Rainfall in Southern California, uh, mostly in the winter months. Before that, it's pretty dry, as you can see. And this is rainfall from San Diego, which is to the south of San Juan Capistrano, maybe about, I don't know, 80 miles to the south. And uh, a typical rainfall pattern, there wasn't really much rain uh, the preceding years. And so I started to collect pellets uh, over a course of a year. Uh, that was between, uh, in 1991 to 1992. E each pellet was given a specimen card uh, for it. And you can see the first pellet, number one, was collected the day after, I think, that community garage sale. Uh, it had some banded hair from identified as uh, raccoon. Uh, on uh, pellet number two, we had some wood rat claws there, whiskers, uh, etc. Uh, we would um, uh, oven dry the pellets and then weigh them, measure them, etc. And by the time we were through and we had 3,966 pellets to analyze. More pellets than probably any other uh, turkey vulture pellets combined up to that period of time. Here is one of the largest pellets that I have saved. Uh, it looks like it's from an opossum. Uh, certainly not an owl pellet if you ever work with owl pellets. You never know what's in a turkey vulture pellet. Here's another example of a uh, turkey vulture pellet. When you open it up, what is that? Well, that, that's a hoof, a probably some sort of stillborn ungulate. Uh, we found uh, rattlesnake rattles in turkey vulture pellets as well. And then the most interesting to me were pellets that just were composed of vegetation. That's really strange for uh, an animal that's supposed to feed on carrion. 
and this pretty much resembles what is in cow manure. And so we came up with some ideas of why the turkey vultures should be feeding on this uh, in the fall, just before the winter rains. There were four main types of pellets, uh, depending upon what was in them. And you can see the plant material pellets were mostly before rainfall. Uh, refuse was uh, increasing in uh, after the summer. And uh, carrion increased after the rain, probably because small mammal populations increased in numbers. And we recorded numbers of vultures at the roost throughout the year, especially on those 11 occasions. We picked up pellets in the area and tried to correspond the number of pellets with the number of turkey vulture nights. And um, our estimate is that it takes about six or seven vulture nights to have a pellet on, the, on that lawn. I don't know whether they're uh, producing pellets outside of the roost. Uh, and, and in many cases, if there's nothing that's, that's indigestible, they won't produce a pellet, even though they may have been feeding. And the pellet production was highest during June and August, when probably the small um, mammal populations uh, were at the, the greatest number. We did a number of different uh, analysis, just in case someone might pick up a pellet in the field and see if it corresponds to uh, what a turkey vulture pellet uh, would be like. So here's a length times width chart. Here's a length times weight of oven dried turkey vulture pellets. We also took uh, some road killed mammals and uh, watched turkey vultures feed on them. And uh, they're pretty obnoxious animals. They don't share the carrion. They fight constantly. Uh, they may have a dominant order. In fact, uh, these are the recorded feeding bouts. Each one is a different individual. Uh, after they fed, they tended to fly off. Uh, it's possible they could have come back. Uh, so there may not be 11 turkey vultures here. But in many cases, they would, be, uh, they would feed for a minute and then another vulture would jump on its back and drive it away. There was a lot of aggression going on. And what remains is basically just skin and bone. Um, interesting, this is an opossum claw after the turkey vultures have cleaned up the carcass. And so just some general signs of turkey vulture feeding. There were large black feathers in the vicinity of the carcass. Uh, as a result of all this aggression between individuals. Uh, it looked like the carcass was opened up from the ventral side. The head and eyes were intact of the opossums. Uh, the large uh, bones were pretty much stripped of muscle. The tail was there. Um, the spine was there. Uh, and most of the skin was there, at least on day one. Uh, when I came back and looked at it in day two, they were just little pieces of skin and, and hair around the area. So a lot of those feedings probably would not have generated a pellet. Here is a, a figure showing the presence of hard parts in turkey vulture pellets over our year study uh, based upon uh, the, the, uh, uh, what's in the pellet. And this is not, not like a owl pellet uh, situation where it's just filled with bones. You see, even mice, which probably are going to be digested, especially the small ones, entirely, only about a quarter of those pellets that contained purely mice uh, had uh, things like claws or uh, had any bone in them. Uh, and when you get to something like uh, an ungulate, uh, it's, it, it turns out that maybe you know, 2% uh, 
uh, of the pellets have hooves, uh, and maybe something like 6 or 7% have any bone at all. So some of these pellets have no hard parts at all. It's just a, a mass of hair that's in the pellet. And we tr recorded changes in proportion of, of what's in the pellets over the course of a year. Uh, that chart is there. It's also repeated in that paper that I've given you a link to, that unpublished paper. So let's look at some impacts uh, by the turkey vultures on the humans in that development. There was certainly a lot of whitewash on some traffic areas. Uh, there were falling branches that created hazard and the insurance carrier uh, was very concerned about this. In fact, the people at the uh, community were very happy with me. I was basically removing a lot of this debris. There were dead vultures during the study falling into people's backyards. The vultures brought back carrion parts that fell underneath the roost tree. And, and believe it or not, uh, there was a newspaper article on this, and I interviewed the person, that in another small roost in Orange County, the vultures were peeling back the leatherette top of a Cadillac. Um, so, you know, there were some negative aspects. I don't think you would like to live under a turkey vulture roost. There were other impacts by humans on turkey vultures as well. It was right by a freeway. Uh, and if there was a, a car that backfired, the turkey vultures would, would uh, leave the roost uh, and then eventually come back. But they were uh, unbelievably tolerant of noises under the, the, uh, the roost trees, like kids practicing soccer, ice cream trucks, uh, garage doors opening, people walking dogs beneath the trees. However, another impact is that they were ingesting some very dangerous material that eventually uh, I recorded in the uh, turkey vulture pellets. Uh, on the upper right is a piece of glass. We found a number of pieces of glass. And this pellet, this is a bird, mostly bird feathers. And that object you're looking at turned out to be a triple hook. Um, there is, we're not right next to the coast. There are lots of gulls that are injured at Doheny State Beach and other areas. They're ingesting uh, fish and uh, fishermen's hooks as well. And this particular pellet had a triple hook uh, that was ejected. The um, humans finally decided on the landfill to change their policy about scavengers. And I think another aspect of this is that urbanization was creeping toward the landfill. Um, that's so they they stopped these scavengers uh, from uh, their activity at the landfill. There was also finally the removal uh, or close trimming of those roost trees. They were under pressure by their insurance company, and certainly urbanization uh, in Orange County has proceeded at a very rapid rate, especially in the south part of the county, and removing open space that provided these mammal population uh, and the, the eventual carcasses. So to give you an idea of this, uh, I found this online and it indicates that in 2013, that particular sanitary landfill hired someone uh, to uh, have uh, falcons uh, fly over the sanitary landfill and scare away all the scavengers. And it says the purpose of the program is to help reduce the number of gulls and other pest birds that forage in the trash at the landfill sites. Birds such as gulls, I don't think pigeons are going to do that, and ravens can pick up the trash and bring it where it doesn't belong, like na nearby neighborhoods. So there was a concern there. And so that's one source uh, that was removed from these scavengers. 
And then there were problems with uh, trees at these, this development. During the study, uh, one of the uh, ukes were removed that were causing uh, problems with, uh, with the uh, concrete walkways. And then in March of 1993, uh, they finally trimmed down these trees quite dramatically. And uh, that uh, basically uh, caused the uh, vultures to move on. Um, I found this online as well. It shows you the population growth in Orange County, California. And you can see that uh, populations have grown dramatically. And that also corresponds with uh, uh, home building and the loss of uh, wild lands. Although there's still quite a bit of parklands uh, in South County. So what's in a turkey vulture pellet? It's certainly not an owl pellet where you're going to see lots and lots of bone uh, material. It's going to be fragments of hard material. Uh, and I hope I've answered this question and have given you uh, some insights into turkey vultures and their role in ecosystems. So this is another JDW Talks on YouTube. I have a number of virtual birding field trips, um, optic talks, uh, a number of other talks as well, especially one on owl pellets. Uh, I'm also ha have uh, uh, expertise in genealogy, uh, census research, and Ellis Island immigration. And I have um, videos on YouTube on those areas. So thanks for uh, your attention. Uh, if you want to uh, keep track of my various videos, you can always subscribe to my channel, JDW Talks.